All right. Um, well, good evening, everyone. Super happy to see uh, to see everybody, to see so many faces tonight. Um, you shout out to my many students who are on the, on the talk, and um, this will give us a lot of food for thought um, since we're currently doing a translation course. Huh? Um, so for those who don't know me, my name is Charlie Verstrat. I am assistant professor of French at the University of Alabama. And I am the lucky person who will be interviewing our two speakers tonight. Um, and so our discussion will last around 45 minutes and the last 15, 20 minutes will be open to the, to the audience um, as a sort of Q&A. &A. Um, before diving into the conversation, I would like to thank the Department of World Languages and Literatures at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, who graciously uh, sponsored this event. Um, so thank you to them. And I also like to thank the Croisement Voix Collective. So um, um, Jennifer, Jennifer Beaumaquet, uh, Jocelyne Franklin, uh, Erika Serrato, Corinne Labridi, uh, Lucy Swanson, uh, and, and Nathan Dice, who have been working really hard to put this event together. Um, and we are eternally grateful to all of you uh, in this regard. Uh, a few words about Croisement Voix. So Croisement Voix is a, is a digital space that uh, brings together um, writers, artists, scholars, uh, and anybody who's interested uh, in this regard in Caribbean uh, literature. Uh, and it centers on, on the works of Caribbean writers. Um, and to date, we have been fortunate to have hosted uh, Lionel Trouillot, Jean d'Amérique, Emily Prophet, Jessica Oublier, et cetera, and et cetera. Um, and if you are interested, all of our discussions are, um, are available on our website, Croisement Voix, and I will add this to the chat afterwards uh, if, you're, um, if you would like to watch them. Um, let's get into our speakers. The, it's the moment to, to uh, start the conversation. So um, our two speakers are wonderful speakers tonight, are Nathan Dice and Jeffrey Linden Allen. I will start with uh, our first presenter, Nathan Dice, who is currently visiting assistant professor of French at Oberlin College. His translations include the following novels, The Immortals by Mackenzie Orsel with SUNY Press, I Am Alive by Kate Lee Mars um, with UVA Press, Antoine of Gomier by Lionel, Trouille, Lionel Trouillot, uh, and The Black Sea in the Great Lakes of Africa by Annie Yulu with Schaffner Press. Nathan has also translated short works and poetry by Jean d'Amérique, Adeline Bonhomme, Evelyn Trouillot, and James Noel. Um, Nathan is a founding member of the Croisement Voix Collective, and his publications and translations have appeared in Archipelago's Journal, Caribbean Quarterly, Francosphere, the Journal of Haitian Studies, the Southwest Review, Transition, and Words Without Borders. Welcome, Nathan, to this talk. The second presenter of this evening is Jeffrey Landon Allen, a French language specialist at the Foreign Service Institute of the US Department of State. His team conducts language evaluation and assessment that shape policy for the School of Language Studies, which provides pre-deployment training in over 65 languages to diplomats from foreign service offices to US ambassadors. Jeff's, Jeff's translation featured conference proceedings in Italian, service work in Spanish, and a variety of works to and from French. The majority of his contributions to Francophone literature were made under the aegis of Patrick Chamonceau and in association with myself. Nathan Dyes and Jeffrey Allen, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We're super excited to have the both of you and to discuss your translations. Um, it's an absolute pleasure. And um, we can't. We will be discussing two novels. The first one by Nathan. Oh, two translations of, of book novels. The first one by Kitley Mars, Haitian writer, uh, which is "I Am Alive," and the second one is uh, "Crusoe's Footprint" by Martin Kinn, writer Patrick Chamoiseau, uh, trans co-translated by Jeffrey Allen. So, as I described you a little bit, I would like to. Um, to dive a bit more into your backgrounds. So could you both tell us what your background is and how did you get into translation? So maybe we can start with Nathan and then Jeff, you can follow. That sounds great. 
first of all, thanks for having me. I'm so, this collective is always so enriching. Um, and don't bury the lead, Charlie. You're the co-translator too of um, Crusoe's footprint. <laughs> Um, so my background, I come from Baltimore, Maryland, um, and um, I guess it's a very interesting place um, in a lot of respects, but one of the things that I always understood growing up in Baltimore was um, sort of how deeply segregated the city was um, and how that was immediately perceptible based on how people interacted with one another, right? As a white person walking into a public school, I was very aware of my whiteness um, and sort of my strangeness. And so um, over the course of the years, trying to figure out how to, how to reckon with that strangeness um, that I felt and that other people felt towards me, um, it led me to the French language. And my first French teacher was from Martinique. So immediately, she started teaching us about um, Caribbean writers. Aimé Césaire was a, was a house name in our classroom, as was Maurice Condé. Um, and we learned about the glorious Haitian Revolution and recited um, Songo's poetry and um, negritude poetry um, from the very beginning of, of learning French. I'm not sure we entirely understood the implications of the words, but there we were performing nonetheless. Um, so that's really how I began with um, with French and with with really acts of translation, translating myself into space um, and understanding how others translate me into space. Um, and a lot of this has to do with whiteness and blackness um, in an American city, which also has its Caribbean circuitry. Um, I don't know that we'll go there today, but um, these are the sort of questions that really animate um, how I approach texts. Um, and, and as you can hear there, there's something very personal in, in the way that I approach certain texts. All the projects that I've taken up involve a, either a, a personal push towards the text or I see something of myself um, that I wanna explore in working with um, those writers' words. Jeff, would you like to continue? Sure, yes. I, first of all, would like to express my gratitude for your invitation to this very important conversation, especially since my departure from academia. It's so nice to, to pop back in every once in a while. So thank you all for having me. It's a pleasure to be here and to speak with you. My background is from rural Virginia, and I began with French because of a really silly reason, and it was because it wasn't Spanish. I had the choice of taking either French or Spanish, and since I wanted to already categorize myself in a space that was different, I chose the path of French because it was less popular. I had smaller class classes as well, but there was something promising in that path for me. So it wouldn't be until after having gone through some immersive language experiences in high school and my formative teaching years that I really understood the gravity of that decision. And it is by way of some of the literature that I studied in college in my Francophone literature class that took me out of metropolitan France and opened me up to this entire world that is latent in the warmth of the Caribbean that we don't get exposed to very often. And it was one of the first contacts that I had not only with the language, but also with the people. And I had to know more. And I don't know if there's a defining moment to when I began translation, but I will say that after day one of my French class, I was hooked. And not long after I established a pen pal in France and trying to mince some sort of expression together, I wanted to say, how do you say I'm fine? I don't wanna say, you know, I'm doing well, I'm okay. I wanna say I'm fine. Like there's nothing positive about it. There's nothing negative about it. And it was just 
really tough for me to convey. And eventually I would acquiesce to the fact that, you know, it's not going to happen. Like I'm always going to be doing some sort of well in French. And that's one of the realities of translation. And from that moment, I, I understood the importance and not only of, of translating words and thoughts, but also of the images that were expressed and the stories that were told, but also from the intention of, of the author. Because when you translate, you lose a little bit of the voice and that history and the connotation. And unfortunately, that's one of the realities that we face. And you can compensate for that in different ways. But it is one of the trickiest parts of translation. And I think you can all agree with me there. So by honoring their, their words and their choices and their agency, and to be able to share that with an audience, an entire audience who otherwise would not have been exposed to these stories and these narratives and these identities is something that I find ever refreshing and it gives me such drive. Thank you for sharing your personal journeys, um, academic for some of you, for, for both of you and, um, and how you came to translation. So I think Jeff um, nicely leads us into my second question for you, which is, how do you see translation? If you had a, a translation philosophy, what would it be? Shall we go Nathan first and then I'll chime in second? Yes, let's do that. Okay. Yeah, I've been asked this a number of times and I, you know, it depends on who you're speaking with. They might ask you to um, go through a litany of um, uh, literary critics and translation studies scholars and do that whole um, performance piece. Um, for me, I, I've always approached translation in the work that I've done that wasn't just for me, right? Um, from a very ethical standpoint, um, I think it has to be grounded in ethics. And this again goes back to um, sort of my personal background um, and my upbringing, right? Um, in order to work in someone else's work, um, there needs to be an establishment of trust, um, right? Uh, whether that is me working with um, Mackenzie Osell's words or me working with um, Ketley Moss's words, um, you know, I have to. I have to talk with them. I have to. I have to meet them. Um, we have to understand one another to some degree. That's not to say that I need them or I want them to translate the book with me. Um, but I think we need to establish a rapport where we, we're hearing one another, um, and that way, I can then um, figure out how their words need to come out in English, um, because essentially what you're doing is you're creating another version of the text. Um, and we can get into this uh, a little bit deeper when we start talking about individual like lexical items and things like that with individual words or concept words. Um, but yeah, um, I think I think we need to first establish trust. And then after that, um, there, there needs to be a sharing um, along the way. I do send... Um, everything that I translate back to the author so that they can look at it. Or if they wish they can have a friend look at it. I've had a number of um, authors tell me, I can't, well, I can't read English to the degree that um, I would need to, to vet this work. I'm like, well, you have friends. Um, you have people who you, you've known longer than me, like feel free. And, and that's me putting myself out there um, because the, the last thing I would, would want to do is misrepresent someone or misrepresent someone's art. Um, and I feel like the only way to really face that challenge head on is to, to actually have the conversation. Um, so, you know, call it consent, call it establishment of trust, call it a, a translation ethic, um, you know, because, you know, as a, as, a, as a person not from the Caribbean, as a person, um, as a white person, as a non-native French speaker, as a non-native Creole speaker, um, I've had a lot to learn and I think um, still a lot to learn, but um, plenty that can be 
grown in dialogue with the, the artists, the authors themselves. Um, so yeah, that's, I guess that's my translation theory. <laughs> A relationship with the offer, a sense of place, of acknowledgement of the place as well. Yeah, yeah. it's very relational. I, I um, you know, there was this line from um, something that I translated by Jean d'Amérique, and um, it was about what it means to be Haitian now. And and he said something. Um, well, first of all, Jean d'Amérique is a lover of rap, um, and um, there's an opening line there where he said um, something about. Um, it's waiting, you know, what it's like to be Haitian is waiting for, to catch your own bullet, um, which is a, a morbid statement, but it just, as soon as I read that first line, I, I, I knew exactly where it was coming from. Um, I come from a violent place. I come from a place where, um, you know, that can, that can sometimes be portrayed on the, on the front, new, front page news or um, the 10 o'clock news. Um, so I, I understand that. And that's, how I started engaging with that particular text as an example. So relating not only words, but translating ex experiences at the same time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. What about you, Jeff? What is your teaching philosophy, your translation philosophy? I would echo many of the things that Nathan has said. And it's funny that you mentioned the word relational because it's something that's so present in, in Shamozo's works and I almost, did not mention it because I didn't want it to be such an obvious connection, but it is so relational and it is so intimate that the connection with the author is mandatory. You, you cannot have one without the other and that they're not mutually exclusive. So I will back up and say that if Translation and I were on in a relationship on social media, it would be complicated <laughs> because it is probably one of the most inspired, poetic, fulfilling, arduous, mystifying, and unsatisfying experiences I've ever had the pleasure of undertaking because there is such work to be done, not only with recognizing your privilege and your identity, but also communicating the voice of someone else who may not who may not look like you, who may not come from the same place, who doesn't come from the same place, who doesn't look like you, and being true to those words and those message, and it's of utmost importance. I would liken it very similarly to art. I don't know if you've ever had a painting class where someone comes in and says, here's a tree and here's a moon and I'm gonna show you how to draw it. And we of course have our own representations of what we think the teacher is telling us. My moon does not look anything like his, my tree is in a different season than his is. And it's because I don't know how to wield my tools. And so, I will admit very freely that my first translations are not quite as easily read as my later versions. And it's because I didn't know how to wield my instrument. And it is by that practice and it is by that contact and it is by that conversation that you have with the author. And uh, Charlie and I have a shared folder on Google Drive with one of the most treasured files. and. It was a phone call with Patrick Chamoiseau where he explained to us a concept that through reading it, we simply could not paint in English the way it was transposed. And it was that 30 minute conversation and hearing his voice explain that concept to us that you really made that connection. And if I'm being honest, I don't know if we still got it exactly right. And that is one of the most frustrating things. So not only is it a canvas, but it's also a puzzle. So normally your puzzle sits static on the table, but this translation does the opposite. So you'll put a piece down and you'll say, aha, I've got it. And then the entire puzzle shifts or you lose pieces of it. And 
the whole thing is constantly transforming and moving. And that relationship is, is further complicated through that intimacy because you'll spend the better part of an hour on a single paragraph. I've got 30 tabs open in my browser, not only dictionaries, but I also have um, journals of ecology looking up scientific names to make sure that the Caribbean plants that I'm looking up even exist in English terminology because sometimes they don't, or if they do, where you say pen in Creole, you'll say metal writing utensil with lead in English. And it's just so unsatisfying. So I've also got WhatsApp up in the background and I'm chatting with my native French speakers and I've got Charlie. And it is a collaboration, not only of the author and the translator, but of the community surrounding those people. And it is a colossal effort. I love the way you put that, Jeffrey. <laughs> Thanks. So translation is a labor of love, huh? It's uh, beautiful, but at the same time traumatizing, <laughs> according to your words. Um, and I, I think both of you emphasized uh, an essential component of translation, which is we often think of the author's personal experience with the text that comes with the text, but the translators as well comes into play, right? Um, so each translator will have a unique translation because of their personal experiences. Uh, and, and you bring that into your text. And, and I'd like to, um, to turn our attention now to your books um, and, and talking about your personal uh, experiences with the text itself, which is how did you first encounter the novel that you translated? And, and could you go, give us a brief synopsis of what the, the novel is about and why you chose to translate it. So maybe we could start with Nathan again and then move on to Jeff. Sure. Um, so not everything in my life is poetic, but this is very poetic. Um, the, I purchased a copy of Je suis vivant, I am alive um, in the last month that I was living in France um, in 2015, the week that it came out. Um, I would haunt this bookstore, um, Théâtre des Livres in um, Lyon, where I was living, and they would always get the, you know, immediately get um, books by Haitian authors, Caribbean authors, authors from um, from the whole world, the whole Francophone world. Um, and um, I had read uh, two Catlimas novels when I was living there, Fado and um, Au Frontier de la Soif and adored them. So this one stuck out to me. And I come to find out as soon as I open the book and start reading it, um, that it is about the return of sort of the prodigal son figure um, to the family home after spending the better part of 45 years living in a mental institution um, as a paranoid schizophrenic. Um, there are other returns as well. The, the rest of the family members have returned to the family hearth um, or have lived there for some time. And it's set after the earthquake um, in 2010. The, the timeline of the novel is a little shifty, um, but it's after the earthquake and after the cholera epidemic. So somewhere in there in the 2012 area, um, 2011, 2012, um, though it was published in 2015. and. It's a choral novel where every character in the book has a section. They have their say, they, they have um, their way of portraying the story um, of Alexandre, the son who comes back home from the mental institution about his return, about his departure and what was lost or might not have ever been spoken about um, when he wasn't there or how he left and the whole circumstances of, of that family trauma. Um, and I come from, and I really like the French term for this, une famille recomposée. So a, a, it's not a broken family, but it's a reconstituted family. Um, so I have lots of brothers and sisters, or so I have lots of brothers, I don't have any sisters, sisters-in-law. Um, but you know, it, it really got me thinking about how a family life is narrativized and how um, you know, one, one person in the family might tell a tale that's a little different than the other. 
Um, and so it, it just really was so poignant for me um, as somebody who has gone through a similar journey with families coming back together um, after, after absences, after breaks, after ruptures. Um, and so I totally agree with um, what was said before by, by Jeffrey about you know, the personal attachment to books. Um, you know, I come to this book as a reader at first um, and then as a translator. Um, and I started working with the novel um, sort of at a graduate seminar. Um, but then once I couldn't get the book out of my head, I, I went back to the cafe that I was working at um, on that seminar paper and started translating it. I don't know why. Um, and um, has a personal connection with Charlie too. When we were living together at FIU for our Haitian Creole summer um, seminar um, in 2017, I went back to that sample and started working on it again um, because I found the time um, to, to come back to it and it was meaningful for me again. So yes, yeah, it's, it's about returns, about departures, about coming together as a family and um, I would say too that Kedley Miles is not one for, for happy endings, but um, more ambiguous endings. And I think um, this one doesn't disappoint in that regard either. Thought provoking endings. <laughs> so your, this translation um, was layered in space and time. It seems like you mentioned uh, France, you mentioned the US, you mentioned FIU or in Miami and Haitian Creole. Um, what was your experience, Jeff? How did you, why did you choose to translate this novel? So I'd be remiss not to mention that you as our moderator didn't have a heavy hand in this and just some history of Charlie and myself is from North Carolina State University when he had come as a graduate student. We had worked together, formed an excellent professional relationship and realized that we could probably accomplish a little bit more. So when he made his way to Atlanta, he said, hey, I've got an idea. And would you mind doing a translation with me? And I said, OK, so we're dipping into some of our shared interests. A few years prior, one of my first PhD classes, the very first one, we rolled out um, critical race theory. And this is a notion that has been around, published since 1995 and got traction, of course, in recent years, 19, uh, sorry, not 19, but 2020, the year when the world seemingly fell apart. Um, so this was our eighth work together. And I'd like to think that Charlie warmed me up to longer and longer pieces. So we started with poetry. He's like, here's a poem. And I said, okay, we, we can handle this. And then he said, here's a here's a longer piece. And I think we can handle this by this deadline. And I'm like, sure, 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 we can do it. And I'm not sure if this was your intention, but I think you were playing the long game because it worked. <laughs> and so we eventually got uh, this publication out uh, for which I'm very thankful. But as they grew longer and longer, my commitment to sharing these beautiful works just grew along with the length. So we had begun this translation in particular, I forget, was it 2018 or 2019? Um, but a few years prior, and it happened to be at this pivotal moment in our society when much was so uncertain and feelings were just rife with the need to be expressed. And that was done by way of protests, by way of literature as well in conjunction and to be able to transmit some of this message through this work became crucial. And so that really gave us a renewed interest in translating this work into English because the story had not been told. 
And one of the reasons I mentioned in critical race theory is because Crusoe's footprint is a counter narrative of Robinson Crusoe. So the story that has been told from many of our childhoods is now from a different perspective, which is that of a slave who is washed ashore. So the time is different, the colors are different, the scenery is different, the language is different. And it's a story that we have seen from one side, but this is the opportunity to tell it from such a, a, perspective, a perspective that's just missing from, from this whole narrative. So going back to painting that picture, um, we have this slave who's ripped from his homeland and just thrust upon a, sh a shore. And he has no traces of his identity or where he came from, or even the language that he speaks, or what objects are that for us would be very common. And so he is in this world that's been dominated by the other and has to feel his way around and figure things out. And it's Robinson Crusoe, but from this valuable perspective, unheard of, with Caribbean rhythms and colors. And you live this experience with him and it's violent and it is philosophical. And it's an experience that a lot of us wouldn't know otherwise if we didn't read it through this perspective. And so for that reason, it was of utmost importance. To, to see the end of this project, um, one of many reasons. But throughout that story, despite everything, you do make sense of it. You do create a new reality and forge a new identity, but you can only do so by the structures that have been put in place by the dominating voice. So there are lots of moments within this work that give you pause and some of that is because of the the concepts that are very multifaceted and multi-dimensional and one of the questions i remember with charlie it was just one word of the entire book and i said is it yelling or screaming and i said screaming is just it's so violent whereas yelling i think it is it's just an it's more so of an act of raising your voice to be heard or to alert someone. And he said, well, what we're talking about is, is quite violent. And without having really analyzed that word, I wouldn't have made that conscious choice. And so sometimes you, you need to see through the page and you need to be in the galley with the slaves and you need to, you need to hear it. And those conversations and this piece will help you to do that. And so that question of identity was never more incumbent than it was in, in 2020. So the opportunity to share this counter narrative, this neglected viewpoint, this reimagining, this, this hand that's outstretched, begging for you to hear the story, it was almost a sense of duty. And it's, it was such an honor to be able to, to undertake this work, not only to give this perspective, but to tell it to the English speaking world, which was so, so important. Well, thanks to both of you. And I, I mentioned earlier that translation is a labor of love. And when we listen to both of you, we can really tell that you're passionate about this translation. So thank you for doing this work. Um, and uh, one thing that I'd like to mention to the audience as well is the, the behind the scenes is that often translations are um, are published because of translators. Uh, it started with an idea, a pitch, uh, and many people contribute to it. But translators sort of have to fight um, to to get these translations published. It starts with them, um, not necessarily the other way around. Um, so many of the translations that you see published, it's sort of um, sparked a sense of uh, there was a connection that began between the translator and the writer 
and that's how the translation always begins or most of the time begins and you can hear it with both uh, Nathan and, and Jeff. Um, you touched both, uh, you touched upon both um, um, an important or an essential or difficulty, I would say, in translation, which is that it comes with various challenges. Um, and, and you know, a few examples uh, of, of debates, I would say, in translation studies or in translation itself is um, between authenticity and accessibility. You both mentioned that already. Um, the cultural implications, the linguistic um, translatability, which is uh, it can be a sh shortcoming sometimes. So I was wondering, what were some of the challenges, uh, if you had to pick one, uh, in, in the translation of your respective works? And Nathan, would you like to start again? Sure. Well, you know, I say this in the translator's note um, in, in one way, but I'll, I'll say it in another, I guess. Um, you, like any home, like any family, um, you know, something can appear a certain way on the outside, but can be, be entirely different on the inside. Um, and so one of these sort of word difficulties, one of these concept words that I was confronted with in translating um, Je suis vivant is this, is this notion of um, the courtyard, la cour, um, which has so many different resonances. Um, Right in French, la cour can be the courthouse. It can be the courtyard. It can be the yard. It can be <laughs> any number of things. Um, it also has a Haitian sort of level to it, a valence to it. Um, so you spoke about, you know, each translator bringing something subjective to it. Right, um, my linguistic background um, playing a role in the text. I'm I can't not hear la cour, um, which can either be a secular grouping of houses that sort of forms a family compound, or it can be the demarcation of a spiritual community um, that is also then laid out um, in a similar compound type um, out, outgrowth of, of family units um, throughout the Caribbean, but specifically in, in, in Haiti. Um, and so whenever Kedli Mouse would use the word la cour, um, there were times when I heard home, there were times when I heard courtyard, there were times when I heard yard. Um, and, you know, as a reader, I guess that's, it's really interesting hearing um, Jeffrey talk about your process um, with working with, with Charlie um, and have, being able to have that sort of dialogue um, between one another. I'm sort of like dialoguing with texts. Um, so I approached the, I came to the book as a reader and I'm, I'm approaching the book as a reader. So um, I'm a lover of, of Anglophone Caribbean literature. Um, and that's, that was part of my background before I, I could read French at a high level. Um, and so I'm thinking about Jamaican works of fiction or Trinidadian works of fiction that use the yard as a, as a family space. Um, it's not necessarily like a United States English sort of, oh, you say yard and I think houses, um, or I think family compound. Um, I think when we say family compound in English, we, we have something else that might come to mind. Um, and I'm not exactly even sure what that is because we don't have family compounds in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, you know, so the way that I got around this was like really leaning into the multiple meanings of the word la cour. And so um, when, certain characters or certain situations would occur. And it would, I, I heard home, I put home. Um, I put the house, I put um, the old de chien. I would repeat the place name that um, everybody in the family knows it as. And it's also important to note too, that are, there are not just people in the novel who, who live in this house, but there are people who work at this house too, um, this family compound, because it's, it's a bourgeois Haitian family. Um, which felt like a really important story to convey, especially in the 21st century when um, we have such a, um, a narrow view of, I guess I say we, but the international media um, presents such a narrow view of Haitians and the Haitian family that um, one might think that every Haitian lives the same way um, with the same means um, or looks the same or sounds the same. And I think this novel with its chorus of characters 
um, who live and work at this um, at this set of houses at this courtyard um, really speak to a number of things that made me think that this book was was important to bring to readers. Um, and I'll kind of stop there with with the word um, la cour, but you know it really did make me think about you know as I walk down the street um, in my neighborhood, I see the the facade. I don't know what's going on in the front yard and in the in this inside, and I don't know what's going on in the backyard. Um, you need permission in order to enter, and um, this novel is is giving permission um, for this one family. So la cour in the uh, carries a pl plurality of meanings, um, which the English can't obviously. And yeah. I love how you bring the cultural aspect to it as well into your translation. Is that something that you struggled with, uh, Jeff, as well? Is what was there a challenge, a particular challenge that you mentioned one earlier with the word uh, saisie with Patrick Chamoiseau? Is there something? Do you have a different example? Or I do. I actually got another example from when you were speaking, Nathan, and it also has to do with the idea of of spaces. And Charlie was ahead of me at this point, and our translation and we got to the word savan and mm. he said something about the main square but keep in mind that we're on a desert island and there may be some animals roaming around we've got the beach we're sunburnt not a lot of resources and I'm like what is what is this main square what's going on here and this idea is anchored in Caribbean French where you have La Savane as the main square, but also Place de la Savane in Fort de France, which represents this space, uh, this historical space. And so within this one word, you have such semantic depth that you struggle to find an equivalent in English that carries that weight. And unfortunately, I had to press and and make this sacrifice because the main square for me did not make contextual sense. And we had to lose that part. I did include it. We did include it in the uh, the translator's note. So it wasn't completely lost. You have to read between the lines in order to get there. But those are choices that you must make for readability. But as long as you honor them elsewhere in the text in order to provide the reader some scaffolding to understand exactly what these images are, what they represent, the history that they bear, it cannot be understated. Uh, another difficulty with, with Shamoizu is his brilliant creativity because he invents his own language. And not only is that in the creation of lexical items, but it's also in his invention of grammar or even the concept of grammar. And in English in particular, we always capitalize I, the first person I, I capitalize, I capitalize. Our phones autocorrect it to I capitalize. Whereas in French, you don't have to do this, only if it's at the beginning of the sentence. So in the middle or at the beginning, because rules are, um, are relative here, you don't necessarily need that. In English, however, that prescriptive grammar rule, I don't think was our final decision, but the editors who said, okay, we're going to leave this capitalized because it is the writing convention. And so sometimes for legibility, for readability, you need to keep those things in place. But along with those three things, so saisir, uh, saisir, um, la savane, and then the je, the idea of je, uh, we're probably it sounds so simple, but some of the most complicated things to convey and to, to do it in a way that still communicated that, that message. So challenges 
yes, abound. <laughs> and, and the beauty of it is when we read your translations, um, we understood, uh, we understand there were many challenges, but your translation usually comes so smooth that we get to appreciate the work just as the writer intended to write it. So thank you for doing that as well. Um, and I'd like to add something to, to Jeff's point here uh, about the text. Chamoiseau only writes with the semicolon in that particular text, which was a massive difficulty given our Western ways of writing, uh, imposing Western ways of writing, I would say. Okay, so let's finish. I will be asking the last question and then I will give you as much time as possible to, because I know you're all dying to ask questions to them as well. So um, I'd like to ask about the future because we talked about your personal journeys, we talked about your translations. So what's next? Um, what, what are your future translation projects and, uh, and can you tell us a bit about it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so coming off of this novel, I'm very excited to celebrate this novel um, for some time. Um, before the next translation comes out, but I do have a translation of um, Ant uh, Antoine of Gomier by uh, Lionel Trouillot uh, coming out in the spring. And, you know, so with, with I Am Alive, I, I was asked by the press to add a glossary to the end of the book um, because although in the French, there is not a glossary, um, it seems to be one of those conventions that the press did not want to, um, to leave out for, the sake of helping readers um, contextualize things for readers. Um, and at first I was resistant to that, but um, you know, when I came, when it came to me um, this way, I thought, oh, well, let me just look up the words on online um, that would otherwise be in this glossary and see what comes up. Um, and one word in, in particular um, was Gasson Macon Met, which um, sort of is one of those words in, in Haitian Creole or in, or in Caribbean Creoles that, that identifies somebody who um, might exist on a, um, a gender spectrum or might have um, semblance of queer performance. And when you wade around those waters online, um, there can be quite a few definitions that are offered that, are, um, that might be quite harmful. And so I saw it as a, as a turn to um, provide language to a concept um, and a way of being that um, was represented otherwise um, online. And so when I learned for the for the Leonel Tuyo book is um, very much leaning into the way that the author um, uses a glossary because there is one in the French. And so this time I'm playing with that, that glossary idea. Um, and I'm very excited for people to discover that book too and my play with the glossary. Yeah, so not only the translation, but the, um, all, all the extra work that you put into making this translation accessible and the glossary comes into play as well. Mm -hmm. What about you, Jeff? What are your future plans? So I don't know if we can talk about this one yet, but uh, I, I will say that whenever I get a message from Charlie, he'll say, I got some good news and some bad news. <laughs> and the good news is that there's another project on the horizon. And then the bad news, which is not necessarily bad news, is the page numbers that we are meant to translate, which don't actually mean a lot because the margins are different in pages, e-publications are different, but it is nice to have that reference. So the last uh, reference that I had was 320 pages. So. Uh, that is what I have on the horizon currently, and I will leave that up to my agent, who is Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's it's an adventure. Um, so sometimes, as you may have seen um, from from both translators, um, it takes quite a number of years to finish one. Um, so when you begin a project, you know you're starting a long journey. Um, so this is the difficult news I would say to swallow. The most beautiful one is it is a journey, which means you will get to explore something new, right? Okay, well, thank you to both of you.
for this uh, amazing conversation. Uh, I would love to uh, leave it open to anybody who has a question. So if you do have a question, you're, you can tap it on the chat or if you would like to ask it directly, um, can you please put on your camera and, and either direct it towards Nathan or Jeff? Any questions? So Jennifer, I see that you have a question. Oh, yeah. Thank you first to all three of you for such an inspiring conversation. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about the, distrib the distribution and circulation of your respective uh, translations, especially since you're publishing with university presses. So how has it been in terms of, you know, um, expanding the um, readership of your respective uh, translations? Thank you. Go ahead, Nathan. Yeah, I'm glad to um, start here. Um, well, I, I have to say, um, it can be challenging sometimes with the university press um, because university presses are um, initially angled towards the academic space. Um, and when I say that, they usually means the university academic space. Um, that said, the um, series that both the books appear in at University of Virginia Press, Carif Books, um, is a long, has a long list of, of books that have um, been part of both academic and popular spheres. So I'm thinking about like Maui's Conde's um, I Tatuba, um, Black Sorcerer. Um, yeah, I think it's something to be, um, to come actually. I, I, because the book was just released, um, there's gonna have to be a lot of work done, I think, um, for these books to break into new spaces and um, reach new readers. Um, you know, I wish that um, sometimes this actually involves me sending copies to like the Caribbean or to, to people I see on Instagram who are promoting the, the books um, more actively than the press can afford to with their, their skeleton staff that most university presses are, have to work with because they are published, they are supported by the state um, that they are um, affiliated with. So yeah, there's lots of challenges that they sort of abound. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a lot to come. I would say that varying your possibilities is, is a good place to start. Myself personally, I have began in conference proceedings as an undergraduate student. And that's when I first translated some Italian pieces. I was a French and Italian major with a Spanish minor. So that is my, my language undergrad background. Um, and so don't overlook these other outlets. So UVA Press, of course, is a great place to have your name, but there are also smaller communities that need translation as well. So I've done translation for Habitat for Humanity that needed flyers distributed, and this can be done on your campuses. Uh, it can be done in the communities as well. And then you can look to smaller journals. And Charlie and I have uh, published on Small Axe Project. Um, and we've done some printed journals in I'm looking at my, my CV now. It's been, I got to dust it off here. Um, uh, Franco is another one, Contemporary French and Francophone Studies. And so a no isn't necessarily a no. You can get your name out there with different outlets and you can try various publications in various forms. So it could be internet-based, it could be print, it could be um, not peer-reviewed, it could be peer-reviewed. So any, any place is a good start if you're looking into just getting your name out there and I would not be opposed to looking in France as well. We work with a small media outlet that does Francophone film literature in Paris. And so don't limit yourself just to the borders of where you are. So feel free to look not only in France, but also in Africa. You can look in uh, Canada as well. So these, these places are, are rife with possibility. Thank you, Jennifer, for your question. And I will move on to the chat. 
Robin Sims uh, asked a question and I will just read what she asked, which is, I'm not able to have my camera on right now, but I'm graduating this year after studying Spanish. I want to translate written works like both of you do. And I'm not sure where to start as far as finding works, freelancing, this publishing company, etc. Yeah, I would say um, a great resource would be to, um, and I'll type this in the chat, um, look up the American Literary Translators Association, ALTA, um, for, um, for a community. Um, and I'm just typing this. Um, and what they have is they have um, emerging translator um, events. They have events where or mentorships that they'll set up with people, um, so that you know you can work with a, a an established translator or even just get in touch with more translators. They have a meeting. They also have like an annual conference, but they also have a lot of online events. So really, just like surrounding yourself with as many translators as possible. Um, the simple thing, Robin, I would say is just start, start translating. Um, in terms of placing pieces and, and maybe getting compensated for your work, that's a little bit um, harder. But um, once you start working on something, you'll find that there are plenty of people to be in community with um, around the work that you're doing. Um, I would say also um, reading um, certain spaces online, for instance, um, Hopscotch Translation, um, Action Books, um, reading, uh, reading in Translation. These are websites that um, really center translators um, and have communities of, of reviewers of translations. Um, and everybody is usually able to be contacted through those websites, or if you reach out to the editors of those websites, they'll gladly put you in touch. Um, so find people's work who you, you appreciate um, and reach out. I found that translators are very generous um, with, with mentoring others um, because it can be hard to get into a relationship with a, a publishing company off the bat. Um, well, that's, a lot of, that's a lot of hierarchy at times. So a place to start is just start and then find community. Definitely. And I would add that any experience is is good experience to have. I would definitely align yourself with authors whose works you appreciate and whose works you think you would like to get out there. Uh, but in the meantime, there are works. Um, I saw one recently for a local government in Maryland who needs translations for different events that they're they're putting on. So that experience can supplant your CV and get you into that world if you want to move into the places where Nathan was suggesting. So anything that is experience will work for you. And I would also suggest learning a translation management software. Mm -hmm. If you make it into the big leagues, this will really streamline your workflow and makes the whole process very, not, not very, it's never very quick, right? But it, it makes it a lot quicker than it would be if you were just doing a, a Word document and a Word document. So I would just add those two details. Yes, and I'm going to add something very quickly, which is I've repeated this so many times to my students in my translation course now, which is translation is collaborative, even if you may have one translator. Um, so as Nathan said, reach out to translators, they're going to help, they might even direct you into, um, into where you could publish your work. Uh, and Robin, if you are UAB, you need to contact me, ASAP, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, to see translation possibilities, okay? Uh, and we have another question from Sarah, which is, what is your number one advice for undergraduates looking to enter the world of translating? Yeah, I think um, a lot of like what, what has already been said, just start, um, you know, I have um, being here at Oberlin, um, there is a comparative literature program that has translation built into it as a as a structure. Um, and, you know, a lot of the students wind up presenting their work um, at an annual symposium that we put on here. 
Um, and it's all amateur work, you know, but there's there's a real like love for the, the act of translation. So um, get started, um, find, find your community. And also too, uh, this is something that I often repeat to, um, to people I'm advising is don't get discouraged. Um, you know, you might not be um, tabbed as the translator for a specific work, that work might already be, um, you know, being done by somebody, but your words still matter. Um, if you don't, um, if you wind up getting to the point where you're submitting something, um, the, the silence of editors and um, submission portals can be deafening, but talk with people about what is making you anxious about that because um, we're, we all feel it, every single translator does, um, from the most busy working translators to, um, to the, the beginners. So um, really just um, find community and, and I think that will be um, a good source of, of strength. Um, and oh, by the way, anybody can get in, in touch with me. Um, please feel free to reach out my information's online. Um, I was never taught translation or how to get in. So um, this is, I see this as part of my work. So please do get in touch. Yes, and I would say just read, 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 translate, mm -hmm. translate, translate. And if there's a certain work that you find has been beautifully translated, go back to the original and see if you can reproduce that same text or something that's very similar. And you'll get the feel of what it takes to translate a sentence or a paragraph or a theme or a name even. And it's one way to just test yourself with dual language pieces that have already been published. Oh, can I say one more thing? Um, also, I don't know if most people know about this, but there are translators who have published memoirs about translating. <laughs> um, so if you read, say, for instance, Lydia Davis's essays too, she'll talk about translating words and like kind of like Jeffrey and I have been doing work, like talking around problems or quandaries or things like that. But also um, there's one that I really love. It's by Gregory Rabassa who translated um, uh, 100 Years of Solitude by um, Garcia Marquez. And at the end of his memoir about his life and coming into translation, he has a list, a catalog of all of the book projects that never got published um, and that he had worked on with friends of his in Brazil in, in other contexts where he translated. And so it to me, and I, I always recommend this text to, to emerging translators because that work's not lost. That work worked on him and 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 was part of his process um, going forward. And it and it really did amount to a lot of community and a lot of really meaningful human connection. So I think um, it, it's really like, I guess, echoing the humanity of of translation and the and the act that that is reaching out and and trying to convey another person and their words. So it's called If This May Be Treason, by the way. So practice, 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 huh? Practice, practice, practice. Regardless of uh, if it is published or not. Um, there is one more question from Corinne, which is, do you have a favorite translator or favorite book in translation? That's a tough one. Jeffrey, why don't you take that one first? Uh, yeah, this is an extremely tough question. Um, so admittedly, Harry Potter in translation is fantastic. And if you compare the creativity from the original to any other translation, it is mind blowing. And that is just one style of translation that is more for the fiction wor world. Um, I would also recommend Garcia Marquez in translation because that magical realism that you get in Latin American literature is just unparalleled. And if you can find someone who does this in English, it is also something that's quite magical. I don't know if I have a name to give, but I would say find a piece that you think is really well done and then go backwards from there and see who translated that piece. Yeah, there, there are so many. Um folks to mention. I'll mention two because I can't choose. Um, 
the book that I, I constantly go back to as my favorite, um, one of my favorite books is, is uh, Jules Tan by um, Miriam Warner Vieira, and it's translated by Elizabeth Betty Wilson. Um, and I said, it's one of my favorites because I, it's just this extremely um, vivid uh, journal novel um, by a Guadalupean uh, writer. Um, and kind of like what Jeffrey was saying, go back and try to translate it. I, you know, I didn't, I, I found myself coming up against her translation and, and not agreeing in spots and then trying to retranslate and not being able to do it <laughs> and wondering how she got that. And um, just an amazing amount of appreciation for, for the work that she did with that, with that novel. It's also very difficult. Um, there's um, infanticide and um, other violent acts that are described and, um, until I translated things like that, I didn't understand what that does to a translator to have to work through that, um, those words. But then on a more happy note, there's this beautiful translation memoir um, called This Little Art. And it's about the translation of Roland Belt's um, lectures. And um, if you aren't a reader of Belt and you've never um, read Belt, I, I suggest that you that you do, but I also really highly recommend this translation memoir called This Little Art because, um, oh, the author's name is escaping me, but anyway, she, um, she goes through the intimacy of translation um, in a very visceral way and, and um, talks about how translation is more than just a word for word equivalency. Um, and she really faces head on some of the I guess some of the more um, like she she faces head on like moments of gaslighting where translators are are mistreated by critics um, and actively wonders what her weaknesses and fallibilities are and I just find it a very beautiful vulnerable text um, and something that I think um, every translator needs to have a handle on or be able to a space they need to be able to go in because um, there will be critics and everybody is an individual and cannot do the same thing. So those two. All right, let's finish on this uh, beautiful notion of individuality and personal experience into the text. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you, Jeff, again, for this wonderful conversation. I learned so much. Thank you, guys. Thank you all. And yeah. Thank you for every to everybody for attending. Um, and if you do have questions, don't hesitate to either ask me, Jeff, or, or Nathan. Au revoir. <laughs> Au revoir. Au revoir.